Hi everyone, here's the book chemist yet again, and today I'm reviewing A Visit from the Goon Squad, the first book I ever read by an author that was to become one of my very, very favorite writers, Jennifer Egan. Rereading it today after exploring the rest of Egan's oeuvre, I can see that it touches upon a few concerns that are central to Egan's writing, even beyond Goon Squad. Among these exploring the lives of supposedly successful characters whose careers and whose lives in general surprisingly and even inexplicably just fall off the rails and, and crash. Uh, exploring the psyche of characters struggling with mental health problems, neuroses, if not outright madness, but who are still lucid enough to appreciate their own deterioration. And more broadly speaking, possibly the, the central concern in Egan's fiction, the passing of time. Of course, the passing of time, in some ways, is the central concern of all fiction. Every story, no matter its genre, no matter in what medium you, you tell this story, is always about a shift, a change, something that happens inevitably through time. The fact that time passes is the bottom line, the bottom theme at the heart of all storytelling. Egan, however, both thanks to her talent as a masterful storytelling and thanks to the extreme carefulness with which she shapes the stories that she tells in A Visit from the Goon Squad, is able to take this universal concern and focus on it very specifically and explore it in ways that feel new and original and, and stimulating. And the way she achieves this is by looking at the passing of time, by contemplating this simple fact through a myriad different perspectives and through the points of view of a vast uh, set of characters, and at the same time by slowing down the thought processes of these characters uh, and, and, their, and their, their very experiences, the way they appreciate their own lives, to the point where they and the text itself become able to appreciate the very grain and the very texture of these events, of the very texture of life itself, of the way we experience the things happening to us, the relationships we uh, establish with other people, the way we are connected with the world around us. This wide and varied cast of characters are all loosely connected with one another, and each of them in the individual chapter that focuses on each individual character live through pivotal moments in their lives, usually moments of crisis in what is an otherwise successful and brilliant life. They marvel at the passing of time, they are confronted with this invincible force that is vanquishing their successes and their ambitions and all their achievements and most notably their youth and all the potential for greatness they perceived within themselves. The goon of the title of the goon squad is, is time in itself, uh, time Time's a goon is a key sentence that's uttered uh, close to the end uh, of the novel. And time is this force that turns all of these brilliant young people, all of these artists and entrepreneurs and visionaries, into the failing characters, the very humane, normal people that you are confronted with throughout the novel. Surely one of the book's greatest successes is how easily and how naturally it allows the reader, it definitely allowed me, to empathize and connect with characters who are, generally speaking, fairly obnoxious, self-absorbed, often self-destructive, and sometimes slightly evil. Of course, time passes in Goon Squad not just on the intimate, personal level of the character's experiences, but also on the communal, social dimension uh, that we call history. And I've talked recently in my review of The Grapes of Wrath about how novels all have to perform a sort of balancing act where they inevitably, they are at once about the emotional and personal uh, inner lives of a small set of characters, while at the same time being about these characters within society, about the passing of time for society at large, for communities at large. 
And Visit from the Goon Squad is another novel just like Grapes of Wrath, who performs, which performs this balancing act with great mastery, uh, with an incredible attention to the interconnectedness of these two dimensions, and by shining a light at different times on both sides of this, this paradox and this act. Egan's fiction in general is deeply fascinated with history, even though she's not really a historical novelist, with a, one exception I would say being Manhattan Beach. Uh, in Look at Me, uh, which is a novel of immense brilliance that I think is incredibly underestimated in the contemporary landscape, one of the most unforgettable characters is this brilliant historian who has a moment of shock, uh, experiences a dark revelation that completely changes his life when he envisions history, the passing of time, as a horrifying cosmic force that is driving humanity toward greater automation and industrialization, stripping humanity of, its, of what, makes, what makes it human and turning it into something closer to a machine. There is no such moment of shock in Goon Squad, but there is definitely a very sinister undertone running through the book. The unstoppable, ruthless power of history is perceivable, for instance, in the way the music industry collapses in the late 90s, ruining the livelihood and the prospects of so many people associated with this industry. Even more notably, this power is perceivable in the way dictators in the book are able to rewrite history and uh, refresh their image in front of the world through some crafty PR. However, by far the spookiest characters in a fairly grim novel are the final two chapters, and especially the very last chapter, uh, which are set in the not-too-distant future. The book was published in 2020. 2020, 2010, and this not-too-distant future very much resembles the present times that we're living through today. In these chapters, the novel reflects on the revolutionary shift in human relationships brought about by two interrelated uh, technological innovations or discoveries. On the one hand, the rise of the internet, a communication technology, and most notably social media. And on the other hand, the rise of portable technology, let's call them smartphones. And one of the, the most revolutionary consequences of these new dynamics, of the way we, uh, in, we relate with one another, of the, the way we experience our social lives, is that as the novel itself reflects through a rather visionary character who states this in the early 90s, at the very dawn of the internet age, it has now become impossible to lose track of one another. Losing track of each other, getting lost in life and time, is just something that doesn't happen anymore because of this automatic and constant interconnection that we experience. And that is an incredibly revolutionary shift. It's truly a tectonic shift because getting lost, losing track of people, people moving to new new places, new, new corners of life of the world is a quintessential part of the human experience. It's something that makes up the very texture of our societies and of our relationships. The final pages of the novel are especially stimulating and especially fascinating if you read them in the light of this reflection. I won't talk about them in detail because, of course, I don't want to spoil the plot to those of you who haven't read Goon Squad yet. All I'll say is that this, this finale, this ending, could almost seem disappointing if read superficially, it maybe seemed a bit puzzling to me the first time I read the novel, but it becomes instead truly powerful and truly almost uplifting when read in this context, when read in the context of this world where this interconnection and this the impossibility of falling off the net is becoming more and more of a reality. That final disappointment that closes the book becomes all the more powerful and, again, almost acquires an optimistic 
uh, tone, I would say. These final chapters also reflect on a fundamental fact, which is that new generations who grow up surrounded by these technological innovations can barely even realize the way these innovations are shaping their world and the way they connect with one another. For instance, these young people aren't even concerned about some of the more questionable sides of these uh, evolving world. For instance, how open this digital world is to commercialization. And I struggle to think of a more relevant topic in today's world, because even this video that you're watching right now is hosted on a platform that allows me to post the video here and even pays me so that they can sell ad time to third parties. And at the end of this video, I'm going to talk about a sponsorship that provides me with the kind of money that supports the channel. And hey, obviously I'm talking about a book I really like and these are all my genuine opinions, but it would, and also by all means, I am endorsing this system. I am posting videos on YouTube, but it would be wrong and it would be silly not to realize how dangerous this situation and these dynamics are and the great potential for, for threat and the great potential for a loss of sincerity, transparency and directness that is involved in these systems that would be very easy to just embrace unquestioningly. Let me put this differently, because I realize this might very well sound like a bit of an unfocused, gratuitous rant from somebody who also uh, takes YouTube's money but wishes to complain about it. In the final chapter of A Visit from the Goon Squad, we have a character, Alex, who feels very conflicted with a job he's been given. He is basically using his clout on social media to promote a live music event that he doesn't necessarily care too much about. I think it's fairly easy to understand why Alex is so conflicted. There's a bottom line level of hypocrisy and dishonesty in promoting something that you don't really care about, pretending like you actually do, just because you get paid for it, just because that becomes your livelihood. But at the same time, it's also easy to see all this as fairly innocuous. At the end of the day, who cares if the concert is very good or fairly bad? But imagine that instead of promoting a concert on social media, Alex was actually promoting a rally, a political rally, by some controversial um, clickbaity figure who's famous for their um, non-politically correct views and for embracing uncomfortable ideas that uh, all of a sudden f seem sexy and honest and, and gritty and true to life. Because this kind of thing, people using their clout on the internet to promote this type of political views, is actually quite common and has come to shape, it's already happened, has come to shape the life of our countries over the past decade. For another look, a very entertaining but also very serious look at the way forces of evil can use influencers and exploit them to advance their agendas, I'll uh, link to a video by a really cool ch channel I found out recently called Climate Town. There's gonna be a link in the screen and in the description box. I highly recommend you watch that video. It's amazing and really informative. Now that my rant is over, I should stress that Visit from the Goon Squad is still far from a nostalgic book. Sure, the kids these days can't really perceive what's wrong with the internet being so heavily commercialized. But at the same time, it's not really like the, the previous generations were so pure or good or free from the clutches of market dynamics. In fact, the old timers in the book end up looking a little bit sad and out of step with the time and even archaic for not fully grasping the possibilities and potential of this new world. Like the best of fiction, Visit from the Goon Squad points at these paradoxes in the world we, we live in, without necessarily passing an all-consuming judgment over the situation. As I said, it's a very sinister book, but Egan is far from being a prophet of doom. I've tried to dig into some of the reasons why I think Visit from the Goon Squad is a straight-up masterpiece, and there is so much more that I could have talked about, from its beautiful subplots, to the complexity of its characters, to the emotional punches that it keeps delivering time after time and again. 
people debate whether this is a novel or a short story collection because each individual chapter is fairly self-conclusive when it comes to its plot. Uh, the characters are related but somewhat loosely, at least a few of them are. Um, the way I see it is that each chapter in this book is almost a micro-novel. A less ambitious or less talented writer would have been very contented with taking any of these chapters and developing them into a full-blown work. Because of its nature and because of how fairly separate all of these chapters are, this book, more than most, definitely rewards a rereading. Because a lot of the connections between the various subplots and between the various groups of characters are easy to miss the first time through, but become definitely evident and truly stimulating and rewarding as you reread the novel. My only word of warning is that you shouldn't fall into the trap of thinking this is a rock and roll novel. I think it has a bit of that reputation. I think the original American cover had an uh, electric guitar on it. Uh, this is in no way a novel about rock music. When I first read it, I was also expecting it to be about rock and roll. I was expecting either love declarations or disappointment indictments of pop music. But the book is only really about the more arid, even dry and sleazy side of the music industry. And even that world is touched upon in passing more than explored in, in great depths. If you're looking for a truly emotional novel that is incredibly sad, but is not afraid to be uplifting uh, when it needs to be. A novel that's sinister and has some vague dystopian hints without being excessive in a very natural way. If you're looking for a truly rewarding book, Visit from the Goon Squad is an absolute must read. I would recommend it to any reader. And if you liked Visit from the Goon Squad, you must definitely read Look at Me and The Keep, which are way less regarded, I would say, or at least way less discussed than uh, Visit from the Goon Squad, but are definitely as good. Also, did you know that Egan supposedly wrote a sequel or follow-up or in any way some kind of related novel to Goon Squad? It's gonna be titled The Candy House and supposedly it comes out in April 2022. I'll be reading it the second I can get my hands on it. Thank you so much for watching the video. I truly look forward to discussing Goon Squad and reading what you think about the book in the comments below. Thank you so much to my patrons for supporting the YouTube channel and thank you to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. I know I talked about the potential evil of advertisement on the internet, but please believe me when I say that Skillshare is a truly stimulating, really cool website uh, inhabited by millions of creatives and a huge array of creators offering video classes on an immense array of topics from gardening to design, from writing to video making. It's a great place to explore your creativity, get those creative juices going, learn new skills, and just relax. The video classes are split into short videos, which means you can fit them around your daily routine. You can watch an entire class at once, or you can watch a few of the videos that compose it whenever you get a few spare minutes. A class that I really liked recently is called Food Photography, Shooting in Five Styles by Lila Sid. I love food and I love eating, whether it's food that I've cooked myself at home or food I have out in restaurants. And whenever I nail a difficult recipe or if I get some truly spectacular meal, I always want to capture it on camera. My mom lives in a foreign country, she's an Italian mom, she doesn't believe that I eat, even though I swear that I do, and quite a lot, she still doesn't trust me. And very often I collect some evidence just so that I can show her that I'm eating my food. But the pictures I take home of my meals always turned out dark, unappealing, just plain wrong. Lila's class provided some very interesting fundamentals in a very engaging, very entertaining style on how to capture your food in a way that highlights just how lush, how delicious, how splendid it really is. It's a great class for beginners like me, but even those of you who've taken a few shots at their pastas can probably learn a few things from it. It goes without saying, too, that if you like to share your food with others than your mom, definitely other than my mom, 
say if you have an Instagram page or if you have a cafe or a restaurant or any other business of the sort, there's definitely lots to learn here on how to promote all the tasty things you cook. I highly recommend you explore Skillshare, it's a great place and there's a link in the description box. The first thousand of my subscribers who click on that link will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so that you can start exploring your creativity today. Thank you once more for watching and bye everybody.